Right. Um, so I'm going to basically talk about one aspect of the use of the um, Sinapi uh, drain, which is the, the important bit that makes it different. And this is part of where the cost effectiveness comes in um, compared to the normal drainage underwater systems, whether it's the glass bottles or the plastic bottles. And that's the issue of auto -trans transfusion. Now, most of you would probably know that uh, uh, the designer of the um, Sinapi system is, is Chris de Villiers. And um, so my, apart from the fact that I was invited to give this talk, I have nothing to declare in terms of financial interests. I do not have shares in Sinapi as a company uh, or anything like that. The only involvement I have almost about the same time that Willem was doing his MMED, I supervised another MMED for a chap by the name of Charles Cooper, who did, looked at the original Sinapi drain, which you see in the image there, um, and we showed that it's, it's working is equivalent to a standard underwater drain. So that's my only original involvement, plus obviously advising in terms of how to make modifications over the years, one of which is, is the autotransfusion option, which has saved a number of lives already. So those are the two papers that, that uh, the one that uh, we did back in, uh, what's it, 20, 2006 uh, with the design of the, the drain. And then my interest in uh, care for trauma in lower and middle income countries uh, is, is reflected there in a paper that was published this year looking at autotransfusion um, and how we can go about using that to save lives and save blood because we know we're in a country where blood is short. So that's the problem. The problem is blood supply is short in Africa and it's affected by many things. It's affected by malaria, it's affected by HIV, it's affected by an ever diminishing donor population. Uh, in high income countries, they talk about being in a crisis when they have less than five days supply. That's their normal limit for a crisis. In South Africa and most of Africa, we often have less than two days supply of blood. As a matter of fact, we had 0.75 days supply of blood just last week and we were all told, please, other than trauma, we had to stop all electrosurgery at our, at our KZN hospitals. So this is a real problem for us in Africa. And, you know, most of you will have grown up, as did I, uh, on the two litres of Ringer's lactate uh, for, for fluid resuscitation. And then once the fluid is in, then you consider blood and maybe after four or five units, you think about plasma and even longer before you even consider platelets. Now, one of my colleagues over in the, in the UK says that the only good use for salt water, which includes Ringer's lactate, is for cooking pasta. And with the evidence that has come out in terms of the management of trauma patients, this seems to be the case. So we know that we've moved from the classic triad of death in trauma, where we talk about coagulopathy, acidosis and hypothermia, to now recognizing that there's a blood component involved as well, and that's hypocalcemia. When you lose blood, remember calcium is a clotting factor, it's part of the clotting cascade. So when you become hypocalcemic because you've used it up, they now call that the lethal diamond. And for this reason, there's been a lot of studies looking at how do we transfuse, when do we transfuse, and what do we transfuse. What induced a lot of this, uh, Karim Broey and his, and his team from Queen Mary University in London, uh, first described this concept of the trauma-induced coagulopathy. And yes, there's a large number of factors involved, hemorrhage, acidosis, hypothermia, hypocalcemia, uh, as well as an autologous-generated hyperfibrinolysis. So your body doesn't want your blood to clot. And the reason is it wants the vessels open. The problem is you're bleeding out through holes in those vessels. So as a result of which you get into this vicious cycle and that contributes to the coagulopathy. So then came this proper study. Okay, so proper is the uh, transfusion of platelets, plasma and red cells in a one to one to one versus a one to one to two ratio. The ratio being for every bag of blood, you give one FFP or FDP and one part of a platelet transfusion. Now in South Africa, our platelet transfusions come in either pooled platelets or megas. 
depending on whose blood transfusion service you use. If you're in the Western Cape, it's six patients pooled uh, donor. In the rest of the country, it is five patients pooled donor that supplies your platelets. So in reality, for every six units or five units of red cells, for every five bags of FFP or five bottles of FDP, you should be giving one bag of platelets. And some of the newer study, there's the cryostat study that's coming out probably next year, but the provisional results suggest we should also be giving earlier cryoprecipitate around about the fourth unit of blood. And I realize that blood is short, especially in rural hospitals, right? So the proper study basically showed that there was a decrease in death from exsanguination by using the one-to-one-to-one -one -one philosophy, right? That came out and it confirmed what had been suspected from some retrospective studies. This was a prospective randomized controlled study in the civilian environment. And there was a similar study that was performed in the military environment, which almost showed exactly the same uh, improvement in the death from, from exsanguination. So the, these are the things that compete with us because we are trying to stop the bleeding, but we live in countries, not so much where you practice, but certainly in KZN, we have malaria as a problem in, in Northern KZN. Uh, we may be also not as much as the Northern Cape, but uh, we also have the global impact of HIV and AIDS, where up to 30% of our trauma patients are HIV positive, and that affects our donor population. And finally, cash is finite. So our health budgets are finite. And with COVID, they're even more finite because they've been redirected. So it comes down to effective use of blood products. And if the patient's bleeding their own red cells, why don't we use them? That's the point of autotransfusion. Now there's a number of autotransfusion options. I'm going to be comprehensive here, not just cover this in RP device. We'll speak about that shortly. There's this intra-abdominal uh, suction set that's available. It's designed by the World Health Organization for use in uh, lower and middle income countries. I've never used it, but the principle works. And I know that the uh, people that use it in, in uh, uh, LMICs and the Red Cross and MSF, they, they swear by it. Uh, it has the advantage that it's got a filter which you see there, number seven, that filters out bacteria. So you can use abdominal blood and even contaminated blood for retransfusion. Uh, some of the countries keep it even simpler than that. When they get a bottle full of blood in the suction, they literally strain it through a, through a filter system, put it into an empty ringer's lactate or saline bag, put it through a blood filter and retransfuse it to the patient. That might be all you have in some places. And of course, if you're working in a fancy environment, there's all these fancy things called cell savers. Uh, these are two of the, the common ones on the market and a slightly less invasive one, which is used as, a, as for wound drainage, particularly after orthopedic joint replacement and, and similar surgery, again, for autotransfusion. So these are all various options. In America and uh, other places, they have these very expensive atrium drains and, and the Covidian equivalent. And, and this is where the cost saving comes in. These are drains that were designed originally around autotransfusion. But what most of us are far more com commonly experience is these plastic bottle underwater drains. And the problem with an underwater drain is that it's got to have water or in the case of autotransfusion, saline in it. You can't use water for water transfusion and otherwise you damage the red cells. Plus there's the risk of suck back if you, if you don't have a good seal. So if the drain gets knocked over by the patient or by the staff during a recess, you can, you can risk air sucking in back into the chest. These atrium drains and covidian drains, you're looking at between five and 600 rand a drain and they have to be changed every day whereas the Sinapi is a far less expensive and does not need to be changed unless you're using it as an autotransfusion device, and then you can get away with two of them. So here is the Sinapi drain. I'm sure you've seen this picture earlier today. The part that we are emphasizing is where I've placed the red, uh, red arrow there, and that's the connection port for the uh, autotransfusion 
uh, system, which can be a normal blood giving set, which can be plugged in there, or you can use the, the Sinapis um, self-designed one. Um, the issue here is if you, you can auto transfuse up to 1500 mils, although we, we like to change the drain and start infusing when it's at, at about a thousand. Um, we'll talk about the needle free port and the need for heparin in a minute, but this is the concept behind it. And it's, it's a cheap device there, a couple, couple of hundred rand, one or 200 rand maximum at, at state tender prices. They are on the state tender. So for those of us working in the state practice, uh, that is an absolute bonus. And here's an example of one of the cases in, in my uh, ICU uh, where we were auto transfusing post laparotomy. So even though I work in an academic hospital and we have a blood bank on site, if we don't have to give the patient all the risky things of somebody else's blood and we can safely give them back their own blood, especially if it's sterile blood from a chest cavity, we will do so. Um, and here is, is some of the photos from the intraoperative experience. Um, on the left, we're busy operating on the patient with a, with a major injury. And you can see we're giving uh, the, the blood back, but we are additionally giving freeze-dried plasma. That's what we have. You might have fresh frozen plasma. So remember blood that comes out of the chest is usually defibrinated. So you need to add clotting factors. But by avoiding the need for the red cells, which cost between five and 6,000 Rand a bag, if you can save three bags of red cells, then you can afford two or three more bags of, uh, of uh, freeze-dried plasma or bottles of freeze-dried plasma and so on. So it, it's really, it does save lives. Uh, the, there's quite a big study that's come from Suzanne Mukone's unit at Kaya where they've showed exactly the same kind of uh, function and in they're a district hospital with no blood bank on scene um, and they see a lot of penetrating trauma so they use it extensively. So the picture on the left there demonstrates the, the system once you've got the enough blood in the uh, chest strain itself you hang it up connect the giving set and reinfuse. And the giving set has a particular filter which enables the micro clots to be filtered out. And once again, this example is, is in our ICU post damage control surgery, where we are now resuscitating the patient in anticipation of taking him back for further surgery. All right. And, you know, don't do it wrong. This, this, you, you, you have this option, but it's not going to work very well. The, here, someone has connected the blood giving set incorrectly to the, um, suction port for the low pressure suction and as you see at the top next to the big tap the infusion port is there uh, dr gerity who's a, a emergency physician in in the eastern cape sent this to me to say what next so you know it's basics but it's basics that can save lives so what is the elephant in the room here what are the controversies Firstly, people ask about what about the age of blood in the canister? It really doesn't matter because it's defibrinated blood. Blood is blood, it will carry oxygen eventually. Uh, time from injury to drainage, not really a big issue. If they're big clots in the chest, you might still need to go in and, and remove those. What about the need for other clotting factors? So yes, you do need to give FFP or FTP and or platelets, uh, depending on the volume that you're administering. There's no real evidence that some minor chest con contamination leads to any worse outcomes. And then the, the real big elephant in the room is what about heparin? And the, my experience is no, you don't need it for the acute transfusion. But if you're putting in a chest drain for a patient who was injured probably more than 24 hours ago, and you're draining a, a thousand mils because it's a slow leak uh, from a venous injury, you may consider one unit of heparin per mil of blood um, in, your, in your device. Right, so short and sweet. Um, that's what I have to say, and I'm happy to take questions just to, to recommend to all of you interested in trauma to join the Trauma Society of South Africa. And that those of you who need CPD points, there's an Africa Trauma Summit happening virtually next week. If any of you are interested, go look it up and feel free to register. The prices, once again, are, are not um, particularly high. 
uh, but uh, I would recommend it. There's some really good topics. I, I'm, I'm one of the speakers, but I'm only doing one little one little talk and one not so little talk. There's a whole lot of speakers from all over Africa, uh, and Africa's voice needs to get heard. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. We appreciate it. Um, I think it was very interesting. Dr. Schmidt, we have some questions. Um, Yes, um, um, let, let me just have a look. Uh, there was one question here from Art Castle. Um, let me just see. Um, okay, let me see questions here. Let me just have a look. Dr. Schmidt, your connection is not, is not very well. I'm going to mute you for now, and then I'll ask a question to provide calls if you don't mind. I can I can see the the questions on the on the chat or on the Q and A. Um, I'll happily answer them. There's one from Dr. Kevin Menezes uh, talking about connecting more than one tube via a wire connector. I have no problem doing that, and we've done that for our post thoracotomy patients. We don't necessarily always put them on. Um, onto separate bottles, uh, except again if you're wanting to auto transfuse. Um, as to Mariki's question about the time frame for evaluating the fluid above the valve to come to the conclusion that the equilibrium, uh, no, there's no time frame. It's it's whenever the lung has expanded and the um, the balloon is not inflating, then it's a safe as long as you can make sure that the tube, the chest tube, is not blocked. Um, then you're safe to take the, the, the drain out. Um, what's the safe time interval for retransfusing collected blood back to the patient? Uh, most of the time we're doing this for patients that are actively bleeding, but we quite happily, if a patient slowly fills up a drain over 24 hours, I'm happy to administer that blood back to them after 24 hours. The red cells don't lice because they're not in water or saline. So uh, as long as there hasn't been a huge clot forming, which again is uncommon because the blood is defibrinated, there's no real uh, time, uh, time uh, limit. Uh, so Nitin Pharma's question, uh, it's a normal blood filter, it's not a micro filter, we just use uh, a simple blood giving set, the same blood giving set that would be used for any other transfusion. And yes, it can be used for both pediatric and adolescent patients. So it's, it's got nothing to do with the size of the patient. It's got to do with the volume of the blood. So as soon as you have in adults more than 500 to, to 700 mils and in children more than 200 mils, there's a value of, of autotransfusion. Rather give the patient what they've lost. You're not giving them anything they haven't already got. That's the way I approach it. Thank you, Prof. There's also a question from Chris. Uh, Chris de Villiers is asking, Prof. Hardcastle, initially the autotransfusion Sinopa chest drain was used after chest trauma only. Do you also use it after other cases? Assuming filtering the blood, we see more need for this. So in, in short, yes, we have on more than one occasion, but not a lot. We have connected the Sinapi tube into our intraoperative, um, mainly at night, because we don't have the text to run our, our cell saver. So we have a cell saver in the hospital. So for abdominal blood, we would often use the cell saver. But what we have done occasionally when it's late at night and these, the texts have to come in from home, um, then uh, we... We'll try and connect the Sinapi into the abdominal wall, abdominal suction unit in theater and collect the blood in there. And then once it's full, uh, reconnect the normal circuit, wait for the um, tech to arrive and put that blood through the cell saver and, and, and wash it. So yes, we have used it for other um, purposes, but it's, it's sort of one or two occasions. It's not, it's not uh, standard practice. Thank you, Prof. There's also a question from Candice Williams. Candice is asking, during in theater surgery, is the chest catheter connected and the drain actively draining while the surgery is in process? 
So if, if Candace is asking in terms of the auto transfusion, it's you use two devices. So the one will still be connected to the drain and draining the chest. And that can then be swapped around with the one that is being used. So once the drain box fills up, you disconnect it, put a new one on, hang up the drain box, connect your blood giving set and give the blood. So it's not, it's not in line continuity. It's two separate, two separate uh, uh, systems. Uh, although theoretically you could probably make a case in, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, to keep it in, in continuity and then they, they would be willing to often accept that, that blood. But that's a very, um, uh, very unusual situation. And I think Ruben's question we've already answered online and the answer is yes. Thank you, Doctor. Um, there's, a, there's also from um, Davendra. Do you have a SAP draft um, on auto transfusion? Is there any literature? What's the dose in the dose? And can you produce in the dose? And can you please share it with us? Okay, so the, there is a, an SOP out that uh, we worked on originally, which has been adopted and is included in the SNRP uh, paperwork. Uh, as far as any hard evidence literature, no, you won't get hard evidence literature because it's, it's, it's life and death trauma surgery. So randomized trials are very difficult in that context. Um, the do's are considerate and use it. The don'ts are, if you've got lots of abdominal contamination, obviously we try not to use that abdominal blood, but the work that Doug Bowley and his team in Johannesburg did a few years ago where they were looking at cell saved blood, even if there was fecal contamination, there was no increase in sepsis. So as long as you filter it properly, and that's why if we're using it for abdominal blood, we do put it through the cell saver machine. So if you're working in a smaller environment where you don't have that, as long as there's no bowel injury, so if it's a liver or a spleen injury, you can auto transfuse that blood as well through a normal filter. You don't have to um, wash that. But if there's a bowel injury, you have to put it through the cell saver or a similar washing machine. So hopefully that answers your, your query. For the podcast, there's also a question from um, Mariki Ordan. Can auto transfusion be used for pediatric and adolescent patients? Yeah, I've, ad I've addressed that one already. Right. So once again, Kevin, you when you need to raise it above the patient to reinfuse the blood, you taking it off the chest drain, putting a new one on the chest drain, and using it as a blood bag. It's not the same, it's not the same uh, system. You can, the only time we would consider that, as I've said, is with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and then we don't raise it very high, we keep it at, at heart level or just above so that the chest drain still works. Having said that, remember it's a valve-based system, so it can be higher than the patient's uh, chest or lung level, and that doesn't really stop the the um, blood from coming out the chest because the blood comes out of the chest by path of least resistance as the lung expands so the fluid around the lung is forced out of the drain and that's what makes the system so much more useful and so much safer for example for ambulance transfers you put a sinapi drain you don't have to worry about the bottle falling over you don't have to worry about um, it running back into the chest because the valve is a one-way valve and you can lie that sinapi drain on the patient between their legs quite safely on an ambulance stretcher or in the back of a helicopter or an aircraft and we've done that more than 20, 30 times without a problem. So raising, raising the drain on its own uh, is, is actually one of the advantages is that it doesn't give you any side effects or complications. 